Hello, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us today for the 15th Entwine Exclusive and our final webinar of 2020. My name is Arielle Sokloff, and I am the Senior Engagement Manager at JDC Entwine. Entwine is the young adult platform of the Joint Distribution Committee, JDC, the world's leading Jewish humanitarian organization operating in over 70 countries. We work to support Jewish communities and international development efforts around the world. Back in March, we designed the Entwine exclusive to give you a behind the scenes look at how JDC, our partners and alumni are responding to, community, to current events and taking action to lead their communities. We have had updates from Rwanda, India, Dubai and Latin America. We learned about the impact of COVID-19 on the global South. We explored how young entrepreneurs have adapted to a changing environment and how LGBTQ plus leaders are guiding their communities. I hope that these programs brought you a bit closer to the incredible people who are making a difference every day. We are closing out our 2020 exclusives during the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, the festival of lights and resilience. The world is a bit dark right now, so we are drawing inspiration from three powerful young leaders who are bringing light into the world. All of them are either past participants of Entwine programs or partners of JDC on the ground. I'm really looking forward to hearing their stories today. Our conversation will be moderated by Barry Kahan. Barry is the founder and CEO of Rishon Global, an accelerator of grassroots initiatives created and run by, Jewish, by young Jewish spiritual entrepreneurs around the world. Barry is a dear friend of JDC Antoine, and we're thrilled to have his expertise in the room with us today. Barry, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Ariel. I'm so excited and thrilled to be here. And let's get right at it and then meet our guest today. First, we're going to introduce you to Alona Drzhenia. She is a co-founder of JUICE, which JUICE is a global model of youth-inspired Jewish renewal and discovery, and she's joining us today from Kiev. Welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Okay. And our next guest is Aaron Zykus. Aaron is the founder of Rise and Sundara, which brings <coughs> soap and hygiene to those who can't afford it, while providing economic opportunity to the unemployed women. And she's joining us today from Brooklyn. Welcome. Thank you, Barry. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. It's a pleasure to have you. And then last but not least, we have Tomas Buchler, representing Seji, a Jewish contribution to inclusive Europe. And it's, he's joining us today from Brussels. Thank you so much, Tomas. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. All right, so thanks to all of you, and let's now learn more about each of our guests and their inspiring work. And to do that, I asked each of them to submit a series of photographs that best represent why they're doing what they're doing and what it is exactly they are doing. And I think that we're going to start with you, Alona. So uh, as we look at this photograph, Explain to the audience how this uh, represents your story about why you were moved to help create Jews. Thank you very much. Uh, this picture is from the Jews event, which called Hip Hop Hanukkah Party. And I picked up this picture because it represents something what uh, eight years ago in Kiev we didn't have. Um, I have to say that I personally found out about my Jewish roots in the age of uh, 25 wow. and at the time I have no no nice ways to start my Jewish journey in the way which I would find comfortable for myself um, I really actually had nowhere to go there were no attractive options for young adults to be engaged into the Jewish life and there were a few programs but those programs which existed were all styled and positioned young adults as a passive consumers and not as an active participants of community life building. Uh, and I was like, uh, I want to give something and not just to take. And I was happy to meet a group of people who shared the same vision. Uh, everyone with their personal reasons and stories, but with the one dream to change the way of how their community looks. 
so we just wanted to create something for ourselves, uh, something cool, something fun, uh, with a new narrative and Judaism will um, is ex explored through modern, fun and cool ways and Jewish young adults are no longer perceived as passive consumers and recipients of services, but as those who have really high potential and ability to contribute to the community life and to help the most vulnerable. So we decided that we want to connect people around doing good in a cool and, and attractive way. And, and we started Jews. So correct me if I'm wrong, in, in the former Soviet Union, there really wasn't a history of volunteerism or a um, sort of a, uh, a culture of, you know, people helping other, or feeling responsible to help each other. So this was really, you know, out of the box, which, which made it a lot, I, I think, a lot more challenging. Is that, is that correct to say? Absolutely. You're absolutely right in this. Um, <coughs> Uh, we were a little bit afraid of introducing something uh, where people will have to give back for participation in our events. And uh, at that time, we actually were the first one who asked participants to give back and to donate. Uh, but it, it wasn't like donation for participation. It was like an is uh, which was sent to help uh, vulnerable people, mostly children with a severe disease. And we were told by many that it will not work. Uh, but we decided to try. Uh, and we really believed in this. Uh, and, and it worked. All right, well, we're going to hear a lot more about that in the next, on the next question, but thanks for really enlightening us about what it is that you do and, and what JUICE is about. So I, think it's, I think it's awesome, and I'm excited to hear more about that. Um, next, uh, I think we'll ask Erin to share your story and your, and your moment of realization that called you to act, to do what it is you're doing now. You know, share that with us and how this photograph sort of uh, symbolizes that for you. Thank you, Barry. Absolutely. Um, so this photo is uh, one of me at age 23. So, uh, wow, no, eight years ago <laughs> um, in a rural village in northern Thailand on the border with Myanmar. Um, I was actually in this village a few years after graduating, working with a Jewish organization called Justify. Um, and we would go into schools and work with children who were at, at uh, risk for being trafficked. And I remember one day at this village, um, I realized that there was no soap. And the next day I brought some soap to these children and I gave it to them and I said, here you go, wash your hands. And I watched as children who were 11, 12, 13, took the bars of soap, unwrapped it and you know, balanced it on their heads or tried to eat it or scratched it with their fingernails. And I remember having this light bulb moment, like, wait a second, I'm 23. I've lived my entire life without ever thinking about soap because it was everywhere I ever needed it. And here I am meeting children who've lived their entire lives without access to soap. Um, soap is something that's so simple, but um, it's not universal, unfortunately. And when communities don't have access to soap, children are dying of diarrhea, pneumonia, things that children here in the US don't die of. And every year, 2 million children die of these preventable hygiene related mm. diseases. Um, and uh, actually, right after this photo was taken, I ended up getting dengue fever. I got it twice, and right. I was hospitalized in Bangkok. Um, and so I had that a lot been, of... That must have been a great place to be hospitalized there. <laughs> actually, it, it was quite a nice hospital, surprisingly, and had great food. But it <laughs> provided an opportunity for me to really think about, what do I want to do with my life? Um, and I felt very plagued with guilt. I remember thinking about this idea of a birth lottery. And here I was in this very nice modern hospital in Bangkok. I had parents who paid for my college tuition and who cared about me and provided me with health care. Um, and here these children were only a few miles away growing up without access to any of that. Um, 
And I remember feeling so guilty about the fact that I had essentially won the birth lottery and they had lost it just because of luck or being unlucky in their case. And I felt guilty, but I also realized that feeling guilty doesn't really help. And so I wanted to do something about it. And I think it was that moment in that hospital bed, having time to think and really process my experiences that I realized that I wanted to do something with my life to change the playing field so that children are not growing up without access to something as simple and basic and life-saving as soap. All right, well, thank you for that, but I think you're leaving out something, okay? You know, take us back even further. So you, you started the story when you were in Thailand, okay? Yeah. Well, there was a journey from, where did, where, where did you grow up, in New York? Uh, I actually grew up outside of Boston. At, at Boston, so you, there was a story about you growing up in Boston, but you know, how did you, there's stuff happened between then and how you got to Thailand. And like yeah. share that with us just for a, a quick second, please. Yeah, of course. Um, I grew up north of Boston um, and I went to the University of Michigan and I watched the movie Slumdog Millionaire, which I hope everyone has watched here. And it was such an impactful movie for me to see children who were growing up in extreme poverty without any sort of social safety net, without anyone looking out for them. Um, and that movie moved me so much that I decided to move to Mumbai. I spent four months there um, living in an orphanage. And so wait, so you watched the movie. Yes. You bought, <laughs> a, you bought, a, you bought a ticket to India, okay? Yes. And then you got on a plane and just left. Okay, mm -hmm. so I think that's, well, I, I think that's pretty badass, to be honest with you, but it, it's probably not the word that your, parent, you, your parents used at the time, <laughs> okay? <Yeah. laughs> but I think that, I think that was important for, for the viewers to hear because it speaks to, you know, your aha moment that really, you know, motivated you to act about something that, that hit you, okay? And that's, and I, I appreciate sharing that. So we're gonna get back to more detail about that as well. So Tomas, okay, you're up. So we're gonna look at this cartoon and you know, help, help the audience understand why you selected this and tell us a story or an event that, you know, um, why this symbolizes you know, you know, your, you know, the beginning of your, your own personal journey to be doing what you're doing. Sure, I'm happy to do that. So, yeah, indeed, I chose a picture from Rutu Modan's uh, graphic novel called The Property, which is uh, one of my favorite graphic novels. And the picture is from a flight from Israel to uh, Poland with a group of young people being very excited with their, you know, Masala Polin, with their March of the Living trip. And, uh, and it kind of shows uh, this idealized image how people who are coming from a different geographic region are connecting with Eastern Europe, or what is their first expression or first understanding of what's going on with the Jewish communities in Eastern Europe. And I chose this picture because I think it tells a lot about my own personal story. I was born just before the collapse of the communist regime in Hungary in a family of, well, Holocaust survivors. I have four Holocaust survivor grandparents, and I'm sure you all know that it's a, it's a, it's a well-known phenomena that many of the survivors started to tell their, their experiences for the first time to their grandchildren and not to their children. And I was the, the youngest grandchildren, and I guess I got all the stories, all the all their trauma. It was all projected on me even at a very, very young age. So I think my first connection with Judaism was very much, you know, through their trauma, which actually, you know, it gives a lot of work uh, to, uh, you know, to my therapist, if I would have one, I guess, <laughs> uh, make a living out of it. So, but this was really my first understanding of Judaism, hearing my grandparents' stories, hearing the stories of my aunts and uncles and how they survived and, who did not survive and and you know and and how did that that unfold and uh, and on the other hand just a few years after the collapse of uh, after the communist regime collapsed all of a sudden the jewish community began its 
its progress to, to revive itself and, and what we call today the Jewish Renaissance of Eastern Europe of the 90s. All of a sudden there were Jewish schools, Jewish youth movements. I was very much part of that revival personally. And I think that all of us who grew up in the 90s, we all felt that, that there is a, an, an enormous potential in our community. It's a large community of 100,000 Jews really creating change on a daily basis. And I think that this was what all kept us very excited. And, and there was definitely a new story there. However, and this is where the picture comes to the story, that the first Jews I met outside of Hungary and outside of Europe, mostly young American Jews and Israelis, uh, or not necessarily young, any Jews outside, from outside, I think there was a very strong interest in two things. One was about the Holocaust and Holocaust remembrance. And second was mostly about anti-Semitism and how we are you know, dealing with anti-Semitism. And as much as they were all part of our reality, these were not the stories we wanted to tell as young Jews. We were very keen to tell a very positive story of Jewish revival, and we were more hesitant to share what we brought from home, the trauma, the fear, and, and, and the reality of anti-Semitism, which was very much present. And I have to tell you that I think it made us really frustrated and angry. And I think that anger is still very present in my generation when it comes to that. I feel that the story that we're so keen to tell and we are still want to tell is so radically different from you know from this kind of idealized victimized eastern european jewish so community. so so the so your your experience is people in the and the outside jewish community has you sort of locked into the past and you can't Absolutely. get out like you know for, for yeah. many many jews coming coming from the outside, they would they would think about, when it comes to Central and Eastern Europe, they would think about the shtetl and Yiddish and, and, and the Holocaust and pogroms and, and anti-Semitism. To think about a non-victimized, successful, reviving, strong Jewish Eastern European community is almost countercultural. It goes against right. the mainstream American Jewish narrative. It goes against the mainstream Zionist narrative. It doesn't fit. Our story is way beyond the comfort zone of most of the Jewish narratives outside of Eastern Europe. Meaning that everything that we are trying to say, it's, people are reluctant to hear what we have to say. And it manifests in a million different ways. I'll give you one story and then, I've, then I'm going to let you move on, I guess that once I was in a fundraising tour as a young Jewish professional uh, in the US and in one specific Jewish federation, uh, the executive team of the federation asked me, and this is a, a really bizarre but true story, they asked me if they are to fund the Jewish community of Hungary, if they are to transfer us a, a bigger amount of money, how do we want to spend it? Two options. One, to invest in young Jewish life or to create a so-called evacuation fund. So in case Jews need to leave Hungary within 24 hours, there would be already a sum of money to make that happen. And you know, for me to, to understand that, that this is a real dilemma, it was, it was shocking because I felt that either they know something I don't know about, which is possible, or they were, first of all, genuinely concerned by some sort of existential threat which we don't really think is out there. And as much as contemporary European Jewish life is challenging and there are security threats, this is really just one side of the story. And there is a whole narrative out there, a whole story out there, which is much more complex, much more diverse, and so, I think much more positive and compelling, so you, not being heard. So you decided that your calling was to store, sort of not only tell, but help create the story of the future and direct people's understanding towards that, okay? And it's very interesting, listening to all three of you, you know, you all have three different stories about your revelation or what moved you to get into the work that you're doing, and they're all different, but they're all the same in one way. Um, you all had a reaction to something that you saw that either needed to be fixed, or when you looked at it, it just looked wrong, okay? And for most of us, when we see something like that and, and it hits us in the way it hit you, we, most of us, normal people, we get paralyzed, okay? We think about the enormity of the cause, the enormity of the issue, and we get stuck in our heads about not knowing what to do and, and how, to, how to move forward about doing anything about it. So I guess 
I guess I'd like you three of you now to share with the audience, you know, when you got to that point, like the rest of us got to that point, what did you do differently than the rest of us typically do to move yourself forward and take action to get yourself to the places that you are right now? So, you know, share with that with us. I, I'm happy to go first on that. Sure. It's something I can really relate to is, uh, you know, knowing that something feels wrong in the world and feeling paralyzed and not knowing where to start um, to create change. And so one thing that I did when I was just starting Sundara, which is my organization, is I would tell everyone about it. Um, a lot of founders believe that you know they have to be secretive and not release ideas to the world. Someone else will steal it. But I'm a big believer in just getting your idea out there. I remember telling Uber drivers. I told my doormen. I told people who didn't even know my name. So what by I talking about it, Aaron, it sounds like the more you talked about it, the more real it became for you. Absolutely. Just speaking it out into the world. Right. It also gives you a sense of accountability, even though your doorman probably doesn't really care whether or not you do something. <laughs> you might think that they do, and you might have made promises that you want to make good on. Um, so I really urge people to sort of put this out into the world. And I am a big believer in the more people who know what you're doing, the higher likelihood that you can connect with the partners, the funders, uh, the beneficiaries that you need to really make that idea a reality. Great. Thanks. Alona, what about you? I mean, look, you, you explained us your situation where, you, you know, there was a certain culture in, in Kiev and you were you and a small group of people are hungry for more, like, you know, that took courage and it took a little bit of determination. You know, what was going through your heads at that point and, you know, what kept you going forward? In my case, I always first do and then think, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's not that bad. <laughs> but, uh, well, in my case, I was really happy that I was not the only one and that there was a group of people uh, led by the very talented leader. I hope she is joining uh, us today and watching us. Um, same high. Uh, and so there were several of us who had the, the same vision and the same dream. And we actually drafted our first business plan on a napkin. Nice. And we decided like really, really on a napkin. We met in the cafe and we brainstormed and we like put it down and we decided that let's just start doing like baby steps, one move at a time, and we will see where it will lead us. Of course, so we your so your journey forward was really helped and made easier because you had some other people doing it with you. Okay? And that, yes, had to, and that had to make it a little less scary to, to, mo to move forward. And it brought like more energy and you know, like right. you're getting excited, people around you are excited and it's kind of giving you energy to move forward, yeah. Right, so Tomas, really quickly, you know, how did you like take the first step and what did that look like for you? I think, I think it has a lot to do with anger. I, I, I'm happy to say that, I think. No, it's great, that's a motivator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a motivator. That's good. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, like if you meet th literally thousands of people who simply don't listen to what you are trying to say, it makes you feel horrible. It makes you feel frustrated and you just want to shout and you just want to, you know, make sure that, that, that your voice is being heard. And, and when it's not happening, it makes you feel invisible and it makes you just very angry. And you can build with anger. I mean, it's a very strong emotion and you are not judging these people. You are not angry. I mean, at these people. You are angry because the situation is so unbearable that you just want to create some sort of a change. And I'm, I'm usually very excited to build on that strong so, emotion. So really, we have three examples and then we'll move on. So we have, you know, Aaron's example of just living it as if it's real and then it becomes real, okay? We have Alona, you know, getting like-minded people together to make the make the start and the journey easier. And then you just have, a, in Tom, Tomas's case, you have emotion, whether it's anger or frustration, as a motivator. So, I mean, they're all productive things and, you know, you, you guys are living proof of that. All right, so we're going to move on now. 
And we're going to take a, a look at the next photograph, okay? And Erin, let's begin with you this time, all right? I want you to share with us a story about how this photo represents, you know, the people that you're serving and, and basically give us a little bit of more detail about your project in a couple minutes. I mean, what, what is it that you do and who are the recipients of it? Of course. So this was really inspired by me meeting children who didn't know what soap was. I did a bit of reading on the issue and I found out that in a country like India, 70 million people lack access to soap. And I thought 70 million, that is such a big number and soap feels simple. This is something I can do something about. So I um, pitched a competition that was sponsored by LinkedIn and I won a check for $10,000 and I moved to India to pilot out an idea that um, took soap from four and five star hotels that's normally thrown away after one or two uses. Um, and we hire women who it's their first formal employment and we train them how to upcycle or recycle the soap into new sanitized bars of soap. And we just So you're killing two birds with one stone there. You, you're, you're getting your, your resources and your supplies and you're also employing the women at the Absolutely. same time. And we're also distributing soap to people living on under a dollar a day who would otherwise lack access to soap. Um, and not just that, but we're also providing them with hygiene education about the importance of hand washing, the importance of, um, you know, taking care of lice, cuts, burns, scrapes. Sometimes we even go into menstrual hygiene. So we try to seek to fill a void um, about lack of access to formal and informal hygiene education. So, um, so so quickly, help the audience understand the scale of this. I mean, right now, how many, how many people are you serving? Um, yeah. You know, in terms of the hygiene part, you know, how many um, women have you been able to, you know, help be employed? You know, what, what is, give us a sense of that. Yeah, so um, before the pandemic, uh, Sundara had 40 full-time employees. Wow. Um, with six factories in India. We also had operations in Uganda and Myanmar or Burma. So we expanded wow. to those. As well. um, and at our peak, we're impacting 200,000 people a day. Wow. With, um, sorry, 200,000 people a month with hygiene deliveries and access to education. Um, wow. You are badass. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> really stuck with me the most is um, you know, the 40 women that we were able to give jobs to. Because one thing that I've seen time and time again is that when you give a woman a job, um, the impacts are tenfold. You know, you start to see her posture improve. You start to see her speak louder. She starts coming up with I other ideas of how she can help improve her community, her family, her health. Um, and I think that women are such an under resource um, resource community to really lead change. And when we look at things like health and hygiene, women should be the drivers of change, but often aren't. So um, that legacy of giving women fair employment and seeing what they do with their income um, and with their improved self-esteem is something that really keeps me going. I know that I here in the US, we're making, women are still making 80 cents to the dollar, but in a country like India, um, their situation is far worse. So I feel right. like, as a woman, I have a responsibility to advocate for women across the world who are facing much harder circumstances than what I'm facing. Well, here it sounds like they have a really, really good advocate. So great, Thanks. great work. So Tomas, really quickly, uh, what's your story in terms of, you know, how does this photograph depict, you know, the people that you're serving and how you're serving them? Okay. So I chose this picture because I think it really represents some of the work that we are doing at SEGI. Uh, yeah, I want, to, I want to actually follow up on what I said previously and what connects me to this picture that I think that once you are a centralized Eastern European Jew, you are, you are given a role to reflect on Holocaust and sometimes, you know, kind of what's happening in the community. But it's very rare that we are being asked to contribute to other issues and to, to kind of 
think in a more systemic way as Central and Eastern European Jews. And I think once we started the NOAA project in Etseji, which is um, an organization dealing with education and, and advocacy uh, from a Jewish point of view in uh, at European organizations and European institutions, um, I think we very much felt that that we as young Jews, we have a lot to contribute to other issues as well. Combating systemic racism, poverty, uh, uh, homophobia, transphobia, and, and, and other issues that we face here in Europe, not just in Central Eastern Europe, but in Europe at large. And we thought that if we are to deal with these issues, we have to create a whole different project. Uh, we have to shift paradigm and we have to have a very different and, and much more holistic approach toward these issues. And I think that is what this picture represents. And what we are actually doing at SEGI is that we are combating hatred through the tools of advocacy, education, culture, and sports, meaning that we create all kinds of initiatives throughout Europe that are telling a very different story on about Jews and contemporary Jewish communities. So in that, you know, I just wanted to give you one example that one of the initiatives that we are working with small NGO in Hungary, where I'm also volunteering called Hover Foundation. And very often we go to high schools to talk about Jewish identity and what does it mean today to be Jewish. And this is always a very, you know, emotional experience for me because, you know, all of a sudden I'm in front of four, 40 high school students who have zero filter on what they say and what they think about Jews. And well, I'm exposing myself, I'm exposing my community, and it's, it's usually very stressful, but also right. very beautiful. And I just wanted to tell you one story from that experience that kind of highlights why our work is important. Uh, it's just one story, but I think it really reflects on, on our reality. Well, of the field. Hold, hold, hold um, on that story, because we're going to come back to that in, a, in, a, in two seconds. I just want to have Alona sneak in here, and then we're going to double back to that story. So keep that fresh in your mind, okay? Mm -hmm. So Alona, you know, how does this photograph, you know, uh, bring out the story about your work at Juice and who you're helping and how you're helping them? Um, this is a picture from one of the Jewish events which unite Jewish young adults around doing good for children with special needs. Um, so Juice is the initiative started by young adults and for young adults and ran by young adults. Um, and with Jews, young adults are customers, producers and also donors at the same time. Uh, we are arranging events, parties, workshops, lectures, and more for young adults. And by participating in these events and through these events, uh, they are donating to help uh, seriously ill children and children with a special needs. Uh, in, and and uh, these children that, that you're helping don't have any other source of help. They're not getting help from the government or anything like that. So you're their only source of support in, in a lot of ways, right? Uh, they do receive some very modest support from the government, uh, but uh, there are always many, many, many gaps, and we are stepping in in the situations where other organizations, Jewish or non-Jewish, cannot help. And we're helping these kids and families in the form of medication, rehabilitation, treatment, covering different health-related needs, and also carrying out social events for them. Uh, like the one you see on the photo, uh, it's uh, arranged by Jewish participants and by Jewish friends and supporters uh, for this um, cute, amazing kid. Uh, when the pandemic started, we have to reimagine our approach a little bit. We cannot arrange offline events as usually so uh but we took it as a not just as a challenge but also as a window of opportunities and we decided that um we will not go online but we will put all our activities in a box uh, so, so ju right. juice in a box uh, kind of yeah it's just <laughs> in a box uh, <laughs> so um we are now um 
we put all, every, like our activities in a box and now we are like spreading this box among the Jewish participants. They can order boxes for holidays, for Shabbat, um, art boxes, um, workshop boxes, whatever. And uh, inside they will have, they will find the cool things to um, or celebrate event or have a host Shabbat or uh, do some art and craft, it depends. And also, uh, due to the Jews' flexibility, uh, when the pandemic began, we were able uh, to start very fast to assist not only families with uh, children, but also elderly and families affected by the COVID-19. Uh, and before any other larger organizations uh, stepped in, we delivered the food and hygienic packages um, by using funds which we raised from our Jewish participants. So during so the you, year- so you, had, so you had funds raised locally, which is already against your culture, okay, His, historical culture, number one. Number two, give us an idea, how many people did you help, elderly people, or did you help during the pandemic when the larger organizations couldn't, couldn't really respond that quickly? It's something around 700 households. It's hard to wow. say person because some people live in together. So it's, uh, um, it's better to count in households and, um, Actually, this uh, became possible uh, due to the, the, the things we uh, succeeded in building during the years before. So we build, build, build this culture of giving back, creating right. this group of Jewish supporters. And when the pandemic hit, when it, there was a really call, uh, it was like- You were prepared for it, right. We raised like, a lot of money to support this kind of people. Very uh, smart, very smart. So. We have more than three and a half thousand uh, of Jews participants. Uh, so 3,500 Jews participants? Yeah, three and a half thousand. For me, it's easier to operate numbers like that. Yes, and during the years, there were around like 1,000 vulnerable families and elderly wow. people. Uh, That's also that. really impressive. So I'm gonna ask the three of you something, okay? You know, look, I mean, the viewers out there, you know, they have to be inspired by this work. I mean, who wouldn't be? But nothing great comes easy. Um, you know, Alona, you're living in a, in, in a society that doesn't really have a history of helping each other. You know, you know um, Tomas, you're stuck in, you know, people seeing you in the past. Aaron, you're in a situation where women are, you know, undervalued and second-rate citizens. So, you know, in all of your cases, you, your success was dependent against you pushing through existing norms that were, that were challenging for you. So, in, in very, very quick, you know, help the audience understand, all three of you, really quickly, how you were able to just push that push through that. I mean, how, how did you do it? Okay. And, and you might, you must have gotten to a point at some point where you thought, you know what, this is really too hard and I'm not gonna be able to do it. And then something must have flipped. So like, just help us understand how people like you and people like that can do stuff. I'm happy to start. Um, I think there's this saying, I don't know who said it, but it's like, if you knew how hard it was going to be, you would have never started. Right. And sometimes I feel that way about my own journey. Um, it's way harder than you could ever think. However, a few things that have kept me going is um, having friends who really support me. And mm. before I decided to launch this, I kind of had to do a friend cleanse and realize that I'm the average of the five people that I'm spending the most amount of time with. So being careful about selecting people who are positive, who are supportive, who aren't going to feel threatened by my success and my living this sort of untraditional life. So your social network is so important because they are going to be there for you on the days that you feel like quitting. Another thing is finding team members who you love and you trust, um, who are going to be 
believe in this mission, sometimes even more than you do, um, because the moments of self-doubt and loneliness are really strong. And so there will be days that you want to throw in the towel. But if you can have people on your team who will balance you out and keep you going forward with optimism and encouragement, I think that makes a world of a difference. So when I'm looking for people to add to the team, I think about, are these people really believing in this work and will they be the best cheerleaders in the toughest of times? And this year has certainly provided so many hard obstacles for um, our organization, but every organization. And so finding that optimism and encouragement in your team members is critical. So Alona, I got to imagine listening to Erin that your, your experience is somewhat similar, right? I mean, finding strength in the people around you to help push through these obstacles. Would that be uh, true? It, it is. Uh, I, I remember in another quote, so when you want to quit, remember why you first started. So if, if this is if we are talking about the inspiration and energy and so on. Uh, but um, we had like, I want to share one challenge we had. Um, we decided that we, and it was our strategic choice that we want to replicate the juice model in many locations uh, all over Ukraine and um, even beyond. Uh, and when we started to, when we were starting to thinking about doing this, first thing we did, uh, we want, we went to some business people uh, who have their businesses in different locations and uh, who have uh, an experience and in, in building um, kind of branches of their business. Do you know how uh, clever that is? <laughs> Do you know how clever that is to just look look to somebody who's already done what you're trying to do in another in another you know entity and just you know learn from their success i mean that's smart okay yeah and we, it's it it what it what worked actually and uh we really got um a lot of insights uh from the business and actually just put it on so, on the juice model and this is so how many how cities are, so how many cities are you in right now with juice um uh, like juice had the uh, core headquarter in kiev uh, we have representatives in lviv it's in western ukraine and kharkiv in south in north ukraine and in Odessa in south ukraine but we are serving uh, people all over the ukraine great and tomas i didn't forget you so two things, Tomas. Um, if you can incorporate your story that I told you to hold on to, and you know, in, in, in reference to this, to this question, that would be great. Can you do that for us quickly? Yes, I can, I can do that. So actually, my previous boss always said that if you keep doing what you always did, you are going to get what you always got. And I think that's kind of a motto that I'm following with my work. And one example is the story that I wanted to tell, that I think that as long as we thought about combating anti-Semitism only through security measures, which was, you know, the main story of the last few decades, I mean, we never really made progress. And I think since we are shifting the paradigm and think we are, since we are focusing on education and on outreach, I think we, we started to see changes. And the story I wanted to tell before was that once I went to a school uh, and in front of a, a, a group of high schoolers, I was, you know, kind of doing a workshop, a facilitated workshop on, on contemporary Judaism and Jewish identity. And the young girl, asked me if why am i doing it if i'm not jewish and i told her that well i am jewish and she was like no you are not i am no you are not and it went on for a while and then i asked her why do you think i'm not jewish and she said that because my grandma said that the jewish faith looks different because the way how the, the nose the eyes the ears and the mouth are kind of mixed up it's not it's not this is not how jews are supposed to look like you don't mm -hmm. have the right proportions and you know, she didn't say it out of hatred, even though it was horribly racist and anti-Semitic. She said it because her nice granny said so, and because right. she was still in the age when you don't challenge your lovely granny. But this tells you, you know, the story how much you know our work is important to combat anti-Semitism through formal and informal education. That's like a powerful story, especially in today's world. So thanks for sharing that. All right, so 
Lastly, I'm going to ask each of you to share um, your last photo and how it represents the future that you want to help create. Okay? So I'm going to give you each a minute or so to answer that question. So Alona, you start us off. No, I'm sorry, Tomas, you start us off. <laughs> <laughs> Tomas, you start us off and reference, reference the photograph and how that represents the future that you want to create. Sure. In a, so in a, min in a minute or so. Okay, I'm going to be very brief. So this picture that you can see on the screen in a minute, it's the, these are the Hanukkah candles on Platz Schumann in Brussels which is, as some of you might know, this is the square where the big European institutions are, the Council of Europe, the European Commission, where pretty much the, the future of, of the European Union is decided. And when you think about you know, the future of European Jewry, you usually don't think that there is this massive menorah or Hanukkah with a bunch of happy children that are celebrating Hanukkah with you know, the president of the European Parliament, with chief European politicians. And this is also very much part of our story. And I think that my work here is to make sure that that part of the story is also heard. That as much as some Jewish leaders said previously that we are, you know, we are seeing the end of Jewish Eastern Europe, or as some other politicians used to say, that you know, we should find ourselves another homeland, I think this, this is the message here. That European Jews are here to stay. Mm -hmm. We have an amazing potential, and the European Jewish sortie is just you know, beginning. Just, and, just uh, beginning, right, right. There. Well, that's, that's, that's compelling and hopeful. And um, I think with, you know, the kind of, you know, energy and emotion that's behind that, you know, I'm optimistic for you. Um, so, Alona, when you look back on the years from now, like, like the result from the work that you, you know, that you had with Juice, you know, how does this photo represent what you want to say about that? Um, this picture is a collage of photos from uh, Jews programs which illustrate things we want to achieve. It's a vibrant community life with the opportunities to give back and to share responsibility for our future. Also here you can see the lady, her name is Nomi, she is 92 here. Um, and we visited her in the framework of one of our programs and this is the first time she is lighting Shabbat candles. And inspired by the stories like this. Wow, I, wait, so this is the, I just want people to hear that. So with your interaction, this is the first time this 92-year-old woman lit Shabbat candles. Whew. I have goosebumps. I have goosebumps too. That's, 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 I'll give you a badass too. That's pretty badass. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually very inspiring and inspired by these kind of stories. We want to replicate uh, something what we started in Kiev into other places and to expand to more cities and locations. And we really dream and we believe that we will create a strong and self-sufficient community of Jewish young adults um, with the value that is higher than just spending time together, with the value of changing lives of people and changing well, like the I think world. you've I think you've already demonstrated by your results that you've already started to change the culture in the society there that's been embedded for so many years, and that in and of itself is like extraordinary. Okay, so are the Jewish participants? Yes. So, Aaron, take us to see Hanukkah future. Okay, <laughs> in your world. Okay, what's that look like, and how are you going to make it happen? Yeah, of course. Um, a future that I've become very passionate about is democratizing entrepreneurship. I think um, I've started to realize my privilege in being white and being Jewish and being a part of a Jewish community that backs me with social and financial capital. And that has made my entrepreneurial journey exponentially easier. But um, through working in Uganda and Myanmar where this photo is taken and in India. I've met so many women who have ideas for improving their communities who don't have access to the kind of resources that I do here in New York. And so one thing that my team and I did during COVID is we raised a social innovation fund. We started with $100,000 and we said to ourselves, how do we find the next generation of female entrepreneurs 
who are committed to improving the health of their communities and how can we support them. So we made grants of $5,000 and we put out a call for applications. We got over 300 applicants from 54 countries around the world. Um, and now I feel like I'm at the part of my story where my job is to help empower the next generation of entrepreneurs, ones who don't look like me, ones who didn't have the privilege that I did. Um, and I feel very inspired by the support that I've received from this Jewish community, and I want to give it back to people that aren't as fortunate. So what do you need most that you don't have to do that really quickly? I think money. Um, okay. I think being, being honest, uh, what, you know, I'm very inspired by ideas of universal basic income and direct cash transfers. And I think that money is power. And so if we can get money from people who have resources and give it to people on the ground who are making the change, I think that creates the kind of change in the international development space that we want to see. I think a lot of traditional aid, while being very well-meaning, is paternalistic. Um, and so I am envisioning a future where the people who are living the experience are the people creating the change and we can come alongside them and support them with financial support, but also connections um, right. and mentorship that they need to succeed. Excellent. Well, not dissimilar to um, Alona and Tomas. I mean, you know, they're, they're you know, putting it back on their own community to make them stronger, to make the future that they want to see as well. All right, so we're, we're running short on time, so I want to ask you each one last question. It's a personal question, and you know, let's just try to keep your, your answers to like one minute, and I will ask Tomas first, okay? So, well, I'm going to ask you all the same question, all right? And I'll start with Tomas. So how does this work help each of you become the person that you want to see yourself as? And how has it contributed to your own individual Jewish identities? So Tomas, uh, I, share that with us briefly, please. Yeah, so, so two things. One is that, you know, like, I, I'm sorry it's going to be a maybe a little cliche, but I'm a parent, and I want to raise my children in Europe, in communities that are safe and communities that are telling a compelling story. And I want my children not to be Jewish because I tell them so, or I teach them so, but because it's a vibrant, exciting community which they want to be part of. So that's, I guess, my major drive for doing the work I do. And I also have to say that given that SEGI is the only organization, only Jewish organization in Europe that is combating hatred on a systemic level, through lobbying and advocacy, I feel that this is very much part of the Jewish values I share. And right. you know, as part of the light onto nations, I think it's a, I think it's it kind of a, a nice connection. Nice, nice. Um, Alona, answer that question for us, would you please? Um, well, um, work with Jews teaches me to appreciate what I have and to be grateful for what I have. And also, I want to see myself as a good, kind person, someone who makes difference in the world. And I think my engagement with Jews uh, contributes greatly to this feeling. Um, and Jews also shows me that there are many, many, many ways to be Jewish and that our community here is very vibrant and diverse. Um, and also, uh, it's strengthening my vision that being Jewish means, among other things, um, is to take the personal responsibility for the future of the community. Nice. Thank you. Erin? Um, well, listen, it's been such a dark and depressing year for so many of us, and it's a privilege to use some of my time to look through applications of people that are really committed to making a difference in their own communities. And I feel like if you have been given a lot, it is your obligation to keep that going. And I think about how much I was given um, every single country I've worked, I've connected with a local Jewish community, even a country like Myanmar. Um, I've been so fortunate to be able to go on several JDC trips with 
Charles Ribicoff. Um, I met one of my best employees uh, through volunteering um, with the JDC in India. Hi, Lauren, if you're on. Um, but I feel so fortunate. And um, I think that the Jewish people have been given so much. We've overcome so much. We've been given so much. And I want to keep that um, top of mind as I move forward and think about my privilege and how I can give it back. So it sounds like, you know, part of your answer is through your work, you're pr it makes you proud to be Jewish. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, we're proud of you as well. So thank you. So um, we're running out of time and um, I hope you enjoyed this unique view behind the curtain provided by JDC's Entwine Exclusive and Rishon Global during this Hanukkah, the Festival of Light and Miracles. We've seen today that this generation, exhibited by these three bright candles up on the screen there, are the light of the future for the global Jewish world. They have the insight about what's possible, possess extraordinary talent, and most importantly, I think they have this fierce determination to fight for the world that they want to live in. A world rooted in responsibility to help those in need and take action about the things that they see that are wrong. So I'm going to ask you, our viewers, what drives you? you know, what keeps you up at night? Today we heard from three ordinary young people without special resources who didn't wait. They just took action. And from that, extraordinary things happened from there. So maybe that could be you. JDC's Entwine and Rishon Global is a place to connect with young adults and groups like this and who are worthy of our support, whether it's mentoring, networking, or sharing expertise. A place where you too can become part of this exciting global Jewish community. As I turn things back over to Ariel, I want to again thank our amazing guests. You guys are so not only inspiring, but you just make the world a better place for all of us, and we owe you for that. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be here and share your stories. And I just want to personally wish everyone a happy Hanukkah and a year filled with brightness and turn things back over to Ariel. Thank you, Barry. Um, I also just want to echo and heartfelt thank you to Aaron, Alona, and Tamas. It was such a pleasure working with the three of you and getting to hear your stories and digging into your purpose, your why. Um, and I really hope that our audience today has been inspired by that as well. I also want to thank Barry uh, and Studio 3655 for this wonderful production and all of the hard work that you put in to make this final Entwine exclusive of the year happen. And lastly, again, oh, thank you to our audience. It's really been a pleasure learning alongside you this year and at our final exclusive today. Later this week, I'll send a follow-up email so that you can stay connected to Entwine through our virtual volunteering, travel, and other engagement opportunities. And I'll also share ways that you can connect with our panelists um, and some other incredible young professionals who are part of the Entwine Network. So wishing you all a very happy and healthy end of the year. Happy Hanukkah to all who celebrate. And we will see you back in February for our next Entwine exclusive. Thanks, Ariel. Bye. Thank you.